Now, this is my favourite photo of my. Uh, it's a great picture. But you may have seen it before. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't. No. Probably seen lots this of This would have been from... I don't... I don't know. The 70s, probably. Looking you see, I, I had... Um, when I stayed there, I cleared out her office for her and went through it. And she just said, oh, throw it away, keep it, throw it away. And if she, when she said throw that away, I just kept it, you know. And she said I could keep it. This is the picture I was telling you about. Um, this is taken, but I haven't got a date on it, by a famous photographer, but you can't have this, well, you can't have the photos, um, by a man called Angus McBean, who oh, was a yeah. very famous, yes, and that's indeed. her in the... Portrait photographer from in the Wild started. Duck. Now the funny thing is, I don't, I can't remember what year it was. Do you remember when she was in the Wild Duck? And, What's it um, called? The Wild Duck. Oh, that's an Ibsen. Ibsen, yes. And um, there was a man called Anton Walbrook in it, and I was taken to see it with I can't remember. It's my parents or my uncle because he knew Anton Walbrook, and so I saw my then. I was very young, I but I mean, I never knew I'd meet her again. You know, we went round the back to the dressing rooms because we knew Anton Warbrook, and she was there. So that's just wrong. Yeah. Do you remember these are the date? Swedish friends, I think. I see. These ladies. I mean, you Britta, might... Workmaster, and I think Tina that one was got... Yes, probably. I can't remember their mm -hmm. names. And they all came to stay. Mm -hmm. And there's another one. And my made us all dress up in these white clothes. Well, this one didn't, did she? But and I'm, I'm in one of them with a white dress, which I've still got the dress. That's me at the I'm end. Left, yes. In the dress that she gave me, and I've still got. I kept tight copies of a lot of my letters back to her. And that's quite interesting because I don't think there aren't any there because I didn't see you. I thought you wouldn't want to read my letters. But the um, towards the end of her life, I was obviously quite worried about her health, and it, it it kept saying, "I think you should really see a doctor and things like that." Before she learned that she was well, there. I guess she was ill because she came to stay with me. That might have been some time before she. I mean, I can't remember. I'm very bad on dates. I'm afraid, and. Um, I could see, I knew that her husband, her, her husband, her stomach was absolutely chaotic, you know, and that something was wrong. But she, she didn't like going to doctors and she just took all this garlic and all these things, you know, thought she could cure herself, but she didn't succeed really. <laughs> and there's a description in there of, in one of those letters because um, she fell in a hole and hurt her leg. And I'd just driven all the way from England, I suppose, and I'd arrived. And she said, I'm afraid you'll have to take me straight to hospital. I've been trying to um, mend my foot with garlic and it hasn't worked. And Glenn had just turned up on the scene then. And so he came too. I remember we went to the hospital. We have a photograph of her with the leg in a cast. Oh, that was probably Edward it. Edward Roberts yesterday. Yeah, that would be it, yes. They put it in a cab. Yes, that would be it. And um, what else? Anyway, in the letters, when she met Glenn, and then Glenn being helpful with the house, and then how fed up she was with Glenn, and she was really frightened of Glenn. He put all these um, swords. I was terrified when I went there, sort of... I think he'd just left, and there were all these swords in her bedroom, and I said, what are those? And she said, oh, I was terrified of those. Those are Glenn's Aikido swords or something. You went to live with her at, was it Le Mazelle? It, it says, shall I read that thing I wrote? I mean, yeah, that, that's That a good would be idea. the easiest thing. Of, I mean, it's pretty embarrassing having to read it because, especially as my son said, it's, you said it's not well written and it's about you, Mum. That's what I'll try. It says, My likes clothes but hates shopping for them. She will buy and wear one lot, throw or give them away, get some more. I remember once she saw a blue Indian dress on the stall in New Zealand. She darted forward, put it on over her own dress in the bustling market, swirled round a few times, paid and went off wearing both. 
I didn't seem to be about me arriving. There's something else with it arriving. Do you want me to go and read? Yes, oh, yes it does later on. on. Okay. Go on, that's great. One day, I was invited to Lyon to meet prostitutes from all over France. Off we went in the van to this vast meeting. <laughs> Afterwards, we were given instructions of where to meet. I sat in front with a local prostitute, my and a French journalist in the back. We were following a carload of very smart women from Marseille, and they in... Um, it was, sorry, it was a crazy chase. About 30 of us missed the main party and landed up in the Garde de Lyon having a meal. They were a tough lot and naturally suspicious of us outsiders, but my genuine sympathy soon meant we were adopted and they nudged us when astonished clients came into view the night out. Some of the men who they paid to sleep with them came in and saw us all sitting in this restaurant. My has the same birth as my mother. They are totally different, yet this could have helped in my objective understanding of her at times. She has the Gemini stubbornness and ability to ignore things she does not want to hear about. Um... She can just pretend an incident has not happened. If she's let down, she will not forgive easily, but if it's a close friend, they will almost certainly be allowed back into her life. Communication with Maya is telepathic. There have been many times when miles apart in different countries, she's rung up and said, Hello, what's the matter, little Joe? She was coming up. On another time in London, I was sitting thinking, How can I reach Maya? I must speak to her. The bell rang, and there she was on the doorstep. It worked in reverse. One time I was travelling through France and arrived early. I found my alone and in pain. She walked into a hole while admiring the view several weeks before. She'd refused medical help and tried to cure it with garlic. And then in brackets, one of the few times this remedy failed. She had no transport. As I got out, she said, I'm afraid you have to take me to the hospital in Nîmes where they operated immediately. She hated it, but a day later, Glenn, who, had just, who she'd just met, and I went to visit, and of course, we all had a bottle of wine. Drinking champagne in the rain at 6am in the morning in Uzes, seeing out one old friend and welcoming in another. Meetings, departures, birthdays, plays, films, events, or occasions for my, a bringing together close friends and sharing. One of the nicest things about Mai is that her friends usually like each other, particularly the women. She draws us into her warmth. Mai visited me in London during her fire-raising period. She had a time when everywhere she went, she went into a television studio or something in London and it caught fire. Everything, everywhere she went, everything caught fire. Really? While having lunch in the kitchen, we heard a strange noise upstairs. My son's bedroom, one of my sons was staying with me, I can't remember which one, was a light. I rang the fire brigade while my rushed about throwing things out of the window and quelling the flames and later appeasing the anger of the fireman directed at my son by chatting them up. She thought it was her fault, not his fault. Probably was his fault. I took my to a party in London at her request once. She hated it. It was a bustling, crowded gathering of people in the literary world. I swore I would never go with her to another party and then in brackets I put I have done, I'd risk saying she finds it easier to make her own atmosphere than to fit into other people's. Though I was touched and surprised when she asked to come to a party given for my father at his picture exhibition, she genuinely was curious and wanted to meet my family. She extends her interest in friends to their families and attachments, though the side of my find difficult is her sometimes complete dismissal of the partners her friends choose, Yet if she falls in love, that person will go everywhere and she'll expect us to accept them. She's a powerful personality, yet I sometimes wonder if the threat she says they feel is not a bit her own. When Mai came to London to work on her version of Strindberg's Miss Julie, she asked me to be her assistant. It was a tough time for her, a combination of physical health and non-cooperation by Ewan Hooper at Greenwich Theatre. This, too, was for me a different my. I'd known her in France, not in her professional role, a side I was then still a bit in awe of. Earlier, working in Vienna, my had met a clairvoyant, and then in bracket I put which, who made me very uneasy. It's the only time I've ever known my taken in, and then I put all bewitched, exclamation mark, by someone I felt was after her fame. She came to a rehearsal, lit candles, showered us with red roses, looking at people's palms. She found an M of success 
on Mai's. I glanced at mine, no M, I thought. That <laughs> night at dinner, with her and Mai, showed my palm. Lo and behold, an M appeared. <laughs> Mai seldom gives up, but this time she had to. For the first time, I saw momentarily a crumpled, defeated Mai wanting to run away. I went to the theatre alone. I stood on the stage and defended Mai against the management. She'd made friends of the actors. We eventually persuaded her to let us go back to persuaded Mai to let us go back to her flat with a bottle of wine. They were very sweet, the actors, you know, they wanted to see her. I think this is a good example of how she seems how what seems negative can open up new channels of personal strength. As I began to build my life and Mai to travel with work, we saw less of each other, but in nineteen seventy I put nine question mark. Mai stayed for a few days in a luxury hotel while filming. I went to dinner each night. I remember her saying, oh, this is a bit conceited, this bit, you're one of the few real friends who can tell me the truth and I want to hear it from you. I feel the same about Mai. She's right, she's right. In life, these are indeed rare contacts. The, those friends we don't have to play games with and feel safe to let down barriers and be ourselves with. Mai and I have obviously had our differences and brushes only very minor, but the bond, like a blood tie, perhaps from a past life, is there powerfully. That's a bit silly, that bit. I should cut that out. Um, I'm just reading this. I've never, Please, re I've never reread it, and I didn't even. Oh, um, that bit. I think this is the next bit. I didn't, you know, I've never corrected it, sort of thing. I just wrote it straight. I first met mine in Provence in 1971. And then I put two or three check date. Oh, yes, this was before I worked with her. At a lunch party given by Lawrence Darrell for his brother Gerald. The afternoon was hot and bizarre, relationships cracking up, drink flowing. Mai spent some time talking to me, a non-entity amongst the famous. That's me. People mean more to her than their titles. There was no reason we should meet again, yet I was not surprised when three years later a mutual friend suggested I might be suitable a suitable dog's body for her. My immediate visual image of Mai is a whirl of vitality in floating Indian skirts, I've put this before, Mula. sensitive for live hands that talk with Mai, often covered in earth and adorned with heavy silver rings, working hands, with Mai no part of her is separate. Words, moods, gestures, all combined to stimulate and include one in her enthusiasm. When I went to discuss the job with her in London, she greeted me like an old friend, showing me photographs of the mass and keeper, her dog. I'm absolutely terrified of dogs, and I don't like them, and the dog was taller than mine. She... <laughs> so I wasn't... that made me wonder whether I'd go. She was dressed that day like Hamlet in black velvet with trousers, a huge silver belt, and the inevitable boots. She always wore these sort of high heel boots. She had transformed one corner of a borrowed dingy basement flat with flowers, smoked salmon, olives and white wine. I was indecisive. I needed to get away, but was this right? We both sat shy, sizing each other up. Perhaps what clinched it for me was when my, my saying, there's one thing you must not do, fall in love with me. I cannot cope with that. I looked at her again. Um, that thought had never occurred to me. No, I replied, I can promise you I won't. <laughs> I did not in that way, though I grew to love Maya as a rare close friend. I arrived in Uzes in 1975, it says here, withdrawn and unhappy, not knowing what to expect. Maya was sitting in a cafe with a large silver mir hand mirror and a basket full of shopping, sit sipping a glass of wine. She welcomed me with a hug of warmth and took me back to the large barn-like room that separates the main house which was to be my home. There were tensions. I was replacing... You better not let her see this. There was tensions. I was replacing her friend and secretary, Elise. They'd been alone together for several months. Both took me into their confidence. I was bewildered, torn in two, but I knew I had to understand and know my, my way, not be influenced by others. Elise escaped from the reality um, of confrontation by going into deep meditation... I could not do this, yet I had to maintain my independence. I selfishly made my van my safety valve. Only I would drive it. Elise said in an awed voice, No one said no to my like that before. She won't like you. You'll see when her real friends come, you'll be ignored. Uh, this never happened. 
alone, Ma and I established an unspoken routine, my working hard for very long hours. In our separate buildings, we rose early, my watered the terrace plants, fed keeper, that's the dog and the cats, made coffee for us both and went back to her office with the windows open. Classical music echoed out scores scores across the valley. I went to down to dig the herb garden, grow vegetables and regain inner strength. When the sun came up, Mai would walk down with Keeper, tease me about snakes, because she knew I hated snakes. <laughs> and, 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 I don't know where I am now. Maybe it's just this little bit I've got. Oh, no, that's not, uh, and suggest coffee. Then she might ask me to type or read a manuscript for her. At midday, a mile away, the post arrived. There was no telephone. Telegrams were frequent. Mai would get on her bicycle and set off down the bumpy road to fetch the news. She never asked me to go in the van. Once, when a sudden storm burst, I set out and found a bedraggled Mai struggling through the torrent. I knew it was not easy for her and she was not used to coping alone, but she was aware of my need for space as her own. We were both secret people about our private lives, yet we grew to trust each other. We had to. I learned to respect the side of my that never indulges in vicious gossip or makes fun of real pain. If she does not like people, she does not see them or talk about them. She showed me some of this trust by letting me help sort out the accumulation of her past that filled one room. Letters, press cuttings, manuscripts, photographs, even piles of outdated clothes in rotting suitcases. It was too painful for her then to look, yet at moments she became unwittingly involved. If I left a box of papers in her office, she would notice something and tell me some fascinating memory of her life. Pity I didn't have a tape recorder. The afternoons varied. We often took Keeper a picnic wine and books to the pool. It was a natural gorge deep enough to bathe in. Mai would sit for hours on a stone in the middle of the river, reading, always working. In the evening, more watering of plants, lighting of oil lamps. I knew never to expect the meal often planned in the morning. Mai's mood would change, but it was always delicious, special, simple and subtle. She never uses leftovers. That's too English. That's what she said. She creates atmosphere, beautiful plates, cheese on vine leaves, candles. When alone, we would talk late into the night, mainly about ourselves. We were both going through a need to share, using each other as sounding boards for our personal crisis. During these months, we grew very close. Mai had an uncanny way of sensing when I felt low. She would gently tease, saying, come on, stand up, smile, or appear with pastis, say, come and look at the sunset or the sea of lavender. The mass was in a beautiful valley. Mai knew its every change. The colours in the fields, on the roads. She wanted friends to share her love for it, and we did. The house, too, with the bare walls, sparsely furnished, huge jugs filled with dry or fresh flowers. The library, her study full of books, the bathroom and its weird, colourful bottles, oils, a tree of petrified wood hung with ornaments and a cupboard of unusual embroidered dresses generously lent or given to close friends. The kitchen was dark, decorated by baskets, candles, more flowers, dried herbs, jars of spices. It was a battle to find a place to roll pastry or chop. It also had a huge fireplace and on cool evenings could be very snug. At times Mai would entertain close friends in the remise. That's a big sort of barn up alongside the house. Guests sat either side of the huge wooden table with Mai at the head silhouetted against a roaring fire from the ceiling hung bundles of drying comfrey and lavender. Mai would talk animatedly to her neighbours then suddenly, bored or wanting to work, swirl out leaving me to continue the conversation and get, say goodbye to bewildered guests who would see the study light burning and hear the music. Yeah. I don't know. That's lovely, thank I, you. I'm I don't know what else I can tell you, really. Did you travel with her uh, from the Mars? Well, I used to go. Yeah, I used to go out when she went to recce things, and we used to go on trips. And when you say recce, you mean is that what it's called? Recce, the when you're looking for places to film and things. Is that what it's called? Oh, I see. Isn't it called that? Yeah. But you see, to me, she was just a friend, a person. You know, I wasn't 
sort of meaning to... It sounds like she... Well, we're interested in her work routine, mm. and you've mentioned... Yes, the work th- routine was very strict. I mean, she, like I said, I mean, if some thought came to her, she'd go out to her office and everybody else would be forgotten. And, in like, we kept this regular thing in when I was alone with her, which was at the beginning more... Um, and it was probably the same when Elise was there. You know, we had this timetable. That, and I love gardening, so I, I made it a challenge to grow vegetables, which she she always, she always did the cooking, practically always. And then I used to have to do the washing up quite often, or I did do it. But she was never sort of bossy. She was very, she was very easy to get on with. And she had very strong... She took very strongly against some people and said they didn't feel right. But she had a very vivid imagination. I mean, in the first house, because... I worked with her in the first house, you know, and then she sold that, and some of the letters are about the selling of the house, and then she moved to this other house. But in the first house, she could see... Probably other people have told you. She could see... um, I'm so bad about, but she could see Roman soldiers and things up on the hills. You know, she could see ghosts all the time. This was after David had left. Yeah, not long after David left. And David was a very kind person. I can't remember what it was. And he said to me, he gave me his telephone number and said, you know, if you ever want to, please ring me up. And once something did happen that I wasn't very happy about something to do with my or something. And I rang him up and he sorted it all out. You know, he was a very kind person. And they were very close and he was, other people probably told us, he was. He looked after her from a distance even after he married. You know, and I think he was probably with her when she was very ill and when she died. Unfortunately, I didn't see her in those last weeks because I, by then, had very much my own life and was working very hard in London so it wasn't so easy to see her. And also, I, I, I didn't feel she was doing the right thing. I'm not anti, um, what's it called, complementary medicine. It's a better word, isn't it, than Holistic. alternative medicine. Yes, but she was going, and I've seen that before in people who are dying, she was going all over the place. She wasn't sticking to any one... Mm-hmm. Regimen. Yes, and I didn't want to go with her when she... There's some sort of healer, isn't there, in Essex that a lot of people go and see and people like that. And I don't think... I think... I have a feeling that she knew that I knew she was dying and so she... That made her uneasy when I saw her. Can you understand that? Yes. I mean, I have actually been with a... Well, like with Jean Reese, because I was there when she died. I mean, I've been with a lot of dying people and I never talk about it all. You know, I mean, I always get on with it, but I felt, I don't know, I think, I mean, it must have been awful, really, because she was in a very creative mood when she died. It must have been terrible for her. And she, she got involved in that awful man, Sai Baba. Yeah. No, don't. <coughs> well, Sai Baba, I don't think it matters telling this, Sai Baba... She told me all about it. Sai Baba came to her in a dream. Um, She did tell me various things, which I can't remember once. When she was in the middle of being examined in the hospital, she I remember her telling me that she told the doctors she knew what was wrong with her, and they were very surprised. And then she said that Sai Baba had come to her she wouldn't have said a dream, would she, but when she was in bed and said that she was going to be all right and he would look after her. He was a very powerful man and he had this effect on... I had another friend that was completely taken in by him and he had this effect on people. And he was a... Well, he's a, he was an Indian guru. I think he's dead now, isn't he? Did you know anything about him? I knew a bit about him. Really? I felt he was very evil. I nearly bought a house once in Suffolk and they were Sai Baba people and the whole house was full of these pictures and it was a lovely house, but I thought, no, I can't buy that because he's been here. <laughs> well, we are interested in her work routine from the mid-70s until her death because at the Swedish Film Institute where her archives were mm. donated by her son several years ago, Uh, there are numerous, numerous projects. It was clear that she was extremely busy uh, with 
projects, many of them fell through. You're right, right, did yes. not come to fruition, and yet the notebooks and scripts mm -hmm. and correspondence and the wide ranging nature of the projects is mm. quite fascinating. Many of them in Swedish, many of them in English, yeah. several of them shopped in as many as four or five different countries in mm. order to find funding or production mm. people. So it's obvious that she continued to work very hard. Yes. Uh, all throughout. And up until the end, so... Well, her, yes, well, her energy was extraordinary. Was it? Yeah. And you've described a lot in your... Yes. In your written description of her... I mean, how she routine. fitted it all in, I didn't know, because... Well, she always had this... I mean, she was small. I mean, she called me Little Joe, but she wasn't really much taller than me, if that. And she always had this sort of... I mean, the houses she bought were far too big. And everything was enormous in the house, you know, big wooden tables and like I, in those little snaps I got, you know, the bathroom, one bathroom she had in the second house, I think, had about three basins and three bidets and, you know, everything was in, an, in a huge scale. And then there would be this tiny little figure, you know, she got up very early in the morning, watered all the flowers, trudged around the estate and, you know... I and mean, it's an extraordinary person she was, really, her energy. But mm. I think it's very interesting that Sheila Lafarge, who was really her closest friend, I mean, she really adored Sheila and admired her. You know, there were always people. But no, when she was very much alone at the end of her life, because there wasn't anyone there when I went to see, except for friends, um, but no sort of romance, I don't think. We have a question about uh, a friend, of, an American friend of hers mm. that you may, I don't know if I've asked you this before. Yeah. His name was Earl Thompson. He was a writer. I think you do. I think I've heard of him, but I didn't, I didn't know him. He she... died in 1978 mm. and sent her, his, his executors sent her a shark's tooth necklace. You wouldn't have happened to see it. I probably would, but there were so many necklaces everywhere, were there? it was difficult to see one from another. So he sent her that she enjoyed large yes. necklaces then? Oh, yes, yeah, she was, I think, think like I described, I mean, she was completely draped in stuff, you see. I mean, it was all round her everywhere. And she always carried a um, hairbrush as well as this silver mirror in her basket. The silver hand mirror. Yes, and the hairbrush. And she'd sit in, in a table in the street, and you say, doing her hair. And then she'd buy... I don't think I got any wages, but I got all my keep. And she was always buying me ice creams and taking me out and things. She was very generous. She wasn't a, a mean person, but she, she, she wasn't good with money. You know, if she had it, she enjoyed spending it. But she was also a very ordinary, down-to-earth person. She wasn't like a film star, in a, you know. She was, she really, she was great fun. I mean, there was a very funny photograph I've got of her there that I took holding the hoover, you know. Yes. Because she, she didn't, you know, we all had to muck in. Anyone that was staying there was mucked in with the housework. And, she did know. her own housework, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I... Yes, she probably occasionally had a local lady, but not much, you know. Um, Elise indicated that she had a, and perhaps this was only during the period of time that Elise was with yes. her, that she kept the house like a film set, and everything was in its place. And if you moved a candlestick six inches, she would come by and move it back. Was yeah, but, she, yeah she... but I would hate to call it a film set. I wouldn't call it a film set. I felt... That was her, and she had a... I should have put that in my thing. She had a thing like a music stand, and she always had a book open, a coloured picture book, and it always had, you know, and she changed the pictures. She got tremendous inspiration from colour and flowers and books and... From this... Yes, the and her, her the office wasn't... Apart from one or two things like that, her office, like I've described, is absolutely chaotic, you know. Was it? Well, yeah, that's what I was there for, clearing it out. 
I, I think there was a link between us, you know. I I didn't, I hadn't, you know, I don't think about it all the time, but reading that letter, those letters, and there are a lot more, I hadn't realised how close we were, really. She was a great letter writer. Yeah, we she had... was very prolific. And how she had time to do that, as well as everything else. Yeah. Um, and you can tell in from the letters that she was always trying to raise money all the time, so that was a constant battle. And she, she came, there, was a, there was an actor called Herbert Lom. I never met him, but I know she got back in touch with him. She kept in touch with one or two people from her early days of film. I, I, I imagine he's a very nice man. Yeah. But I think she, people weren't very happy when they lent her their flats and things sometimes because she did leave rather a mess by and she was very good at getting it all out but she wasn't so good at clearing it up, you know. But I wouldn't have said our house was like a film set. I don't like that expression. I would say it was just her personality that she imposed on the house. Like most people. Like, yes, like a lot of people. Mm. And it was very much her. Well, it, people's aren't always them now. I mean, I also, my father was an interior decorator and I did some interior decorating. I mean, some people nowadays, they just do it according to what they read in the magazines and fashion. You know. But her home was her own. Her home was her own, yes. Very much. But what kind of cooking did she do? Well, I think that's what killed her. She was mad about these horrible little um, baby poussin, which obviously weren't full range. And we'd go into these horrible sort of little cheap supermarkets mm -hmm. and buy them, and she'd cook them and eat them the whole time. She ate masses of them and... Game birds, of kind of game sort. birds which were probably covered in um, insecticides and things like that. I see. But otherwise, it was quite healthy. I mean, there was, but you know, even if she and I were sitting down to a meal, she would say, "Oh, do go and pick some fig leaves, will you?" And then I pick the fig leaves, and then one piece of cheese would be put on a fig leaf. You know, it was all everything. Well, I suppose that was quite theatrical. It was laid out, you know. Presentation. Presentation was food. very important, yes, right. in every way. Yes. In the third. Yeah. Yes, with everything. No, she was... A... But I think... I, I, oh, I know what I was going to say you before about Sheila Lafarge. I was very fascinated that she said that when she found out, and I think she told you, but she said you didn't seem particularly interested, um, that she was more UK Ukrainian than Swedish. Yeah. Because Sheila said, because she's Swedish, that she never felt she was Swedish. And I think Louis was, grandmother it was, was practically all, Mai's mother, I suppose, was practically all Ukrainian, but you'd have to ask Sheila about that. You mentioned that Sheila mm. had told you mm. that. Mm. Uh, no, actually, she told me that. You yes. were right. Yes. And she heard that from Inga Landgren. Mm. The actress, the Swedish actress. Yes, and... Recently, and it had shocked her, she said. Yes, and... Uh, but she's... Yes, shocked her, but she said in a letter to me that it had... It had um, she wasn't surprised because she'd always not felt that Mai was Swedish, which was interesting. Well, Swai... And Mai did that wonderful programme, didn't she, about make, making ridicule of the Swedes. Yes. Yes. It was one of her first four documentaries yes. called The Prosperity Race. Yes, and how they just stood in the sun when the sun came out and how they get a, when they're born they get given a number and then when they die that person goes to the next baby that's born, gets passed on. I mean, she was always talking about that sort of thing. She was always making jokes about Swedish people and imitating their voices and things. She did two Swedish uh, pieces. Mm. One was the early... 19 early 60s prosperity mm. race and the mm. second was in the late 70s yeah. in a series called cities where she described the city of stockholm yeah that must be the one i know because i you know i would have been around when she was telling me about it and things right yes and she used some of the same uh, mm. descriptions of the swedes yes and 
some of the same objections, not as harshly no. 15 years later. But <laughs> So she did have her, her uh, objectivity about her so-called homeland. Yes. But she didn't really live in Sweden after no. age 17. I think, I think, I mean, she was a tremendous survivor, wasn't she? Because I think she was probably abused as a child and she had a very unhappy upbringing. She does say I mean, it she, was unhappy in her autobiography. Yes, I mean, she really worked very hard, didn't she, to get somewhere and achieved it. And the best thing that was happening happened was, I think, in a way, because when she was young... Like I think it says probably in her autobiography, she was, you know, she was with all these people like in that play and those people like Danny Kaye who she had affairs with, all those actors and Tyrone Power. She was very much in love, I think, with Tyrone Power. Peter Sellers, she did. Peter Sellers, yeah, I don't know what she thought of him, but she was, I know she really loved Tyrone Power. Yeah, she does and, say um, she did. Mm. And so I think, I don't know what Sheila would say because she... She's a bit sort of, she's sceptical about things. But um, I think David Hughes was the best thing that happened to her because I think even though in the end they had to part, she loved him and stayed with him. And I think in one of those letters it said, I apparently went to his wedding. I, I don't remember it, I'm afraid. And then he had these children. Well, I think that must have been very difficult for her, but she didn't let it be difficult because... They decided not to have children, you know. And she really was the main man in... He was really the main man in her life, you know. Ultimately, David Hughes was the main man in her life. Yeah. Well, he, she was with him much longer than anyone else, and he was so kind. Yes, she was very fond of him. She never said nasty things about him. They worked together again, mm -hmm. mm. co-writing uh, several television shows that she directed. After he left. Correct. Yes. Late 80s, even up through 1990, they co-wrote yes. two or three Patricia Highsmith segments yes. for a television production series and a, a children's uh, series on William Tell. Oh, yes. Um, several others. Mm -hmm. The Hitchhiker. Uh, on and on. So they they got back together in terms of their yes, profession. Yes, they, they were working together, yes. I mean, they were always very attached. Time. I, I know what she did. She went to see someone... Has anyone told you this? She went to see someone that did past lives. And I wish I could remember what she said. I don't know who else she would have told. She wouldn't have told Elise because it was long after Elise's time. Um, I remember her describing to me what her past lives were, but I can't remember what they were, and she was very convinced. She was very taken by that. I mean, I think she knew she was going to die, but she didn't, you know, like she never admit, often didn't admit to horrid things or people being nasty to her. I think she just didn't want to face up to it. She must have known. She, uh, the th one thing that strikes me about her mm -hmm. is that although she is a very, obviously from her work and, and from her writing, you, you can see that she's an incredibly sensitive person and she, ha she suffered a lot in life, but mm -hmm. she's never uh, filled with self-pity, it doesn't seem to me. She always moves on. Yes. I think that was her strength. She wasn't going to let herself. I mean, the oh, the most miserable I've ever seen her when she was ill. I don't know if anybody else has told you about the Miss Julie thing. It was then. She really cracked, and I was really worried. That was a stage production. Yeah, but I... I know what it was all about, but I'm not going to say unless somebody else says, but, I mean, that was a very bad time for her. This was the uh, Strindberg uh, play that she wrote where he speaks to his three wives yes. and Miss Julie. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of that manuscript and that, that uh, script, yeah. 
Uh, there is a astrological chart of Strindberg. Yes. Did, were you familiar with that? Well, I knew yeah. she would. Yes, she talked about Strindberg a lot. Yes, and she would have had an astrological chart. Did yeah. she do the chart herself, or did do you know? It was quite detailed. And she qu- might have. I think she probably got someone to do it. I mean, you could tell because her writing was very distinctive. I mean. Who else did she know? She knew... Well, Jill Peirce might know more about that side of her. She might not. But she must have known people interested in... You see, the the great friend of hers that died, was she called Maria, that um, she's mentioned in the letters too. She was something to do with that man called Maya. Yes. Who translated, didn't he, Russian into... Or something, he was a... She, I mean, Sheila would know more about that kind of thing, but Maria, who's I've written quite a lot in those letters that I've shown you, she she was into that kind of thing, and they were very close, my and Maria. But Maria sadly died before my. And um, yeah, she would be like the witch, but she didn't. I mean, that witch was evil, and it's quite interesting that she came with all this brew of good luck and stuff and did all this ridiculous rituals by the stage and things and then the whole thing collapsed so she was wrong in her judgment of that woman is this a mirror or a photograph i think she loved mirrors i Just think that mirror. was a photograph a mirror i think it was really a mirror nice in a frame. Lovely arrangements. Didn't yes no that's a mirror in a frame no she loved fiddling with these mm. things and arranging them yes no. no, she certainly believed in all those things, you know, astrology and very interested in them. And so did Sheila, actually. Yes, Sheila would be a good person because it was Sheila that recommended me to go and see a clairvoyant when I came back to England. But like she said in that letter to me, I I didn't realise till I read read that letter the other day, that there were very few people that she felt she could really trust. I think she she was frightened of being betrayed. And I still think that Sheila, and later on when he grew older, that Louis were the sort of backbones of her life, and David Hughes to a certain extent, yes. Yeah, definitely.